world has gone insane. Cosplayers rule the conventions, gamers dominate the tabletop, and the internet. Sci-fi subjugates the movies, and fantasy rules the bookstore with an iron fist. Only one group can bring order to this unruly mob. A team of uber geeks, masters of the nerdly arts, trained for decades in the hobby shops and basements of the nation. Mobilized by the secret masters, they are the Department of Nerdly Affairs. Hello, operatives, and welcome to the Department of Nerdly Affairs. I'm your host, Rob Patterson, here with my co-host, Don Chisholm. Uh, that's a pretty good rat. Good try, Don. Good try. <laughs> and tonight, we're going to be talking about food. And it's not because we're hungry. We're going to be talking about food in popular culture. So get out your snacks, grab a drink, and let's sit down and talk about food's place in our popular culture. So, Don... How can we discuss food in popular culture? What's a good place to begin? That's another, it's another toughie because the idea of food and eating and, and, and nourishment of that is something, it's always there somewhere, but nobody really gives much thought to it. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to talk pop culture in general, I found the easiest way to look at it is to consider there's three versions of how food works its way into, into story. Mm -hmm. um, the first would be food in entertainment, which is where it's a component of the story. Mm -hmm. Food as entertainment, which is where the idea of, of eats and eating and preparation is the focus of whatever it is you're producing. Right. And then the third, which is by far the most, and, and troublingly so, the most expansive is food by entertainment. Which is where you get into, say, uh, marketing campaigns, ads, mascots, things like that. Right. So as represented by entertainment. Yeah. And, and, and well, yeah, specifically what you're doing is you're taking the elements of story and characterization mm -hmm. and applying them to marketing. And when we get to that point, there's a lot of really odd things that happen, mm -hmm. which is why I consider that. It's sort of its own thing, and it's not exactly just marketing that's going on. There, there's again, there's some really weirdly appropriated elements of story that come in into play. Oh, I look forward to it. But okay, but well, let's work our way back then. So, food in entertainment. Okay, now are we talking the fact that on sci-fi shows everyone eats gray goo <laughs> or blue milk? <laughs> Or blue milk, exactly. Ooh, biggest. You saw that last Star Wars movie. Well, it's the biggest missed marketing opportunity ever. Was the original Star Wars? Even they drank blue milk on Tatooine, and I, I that's re true. I remember that's where I discovered what food coloring was because I got obsessed with putting a couple of drops of it in the milk, and they should have just sold the blue fucking milk like we wanted. But anyway, wow, that like they literally marketed everything under the sun from that Star Wars movie but they never marketed the blue milk. I know. That's and it's the it's one of the obvious ones too. And they could have designed the carton to look like R2D2, use its colors and everything <laughs> like that. Oh, that's funny. And then they could have had like the uh, missing kid thing with Luke's picture on the side. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen these men? Um <laughs> Have you seen this boy? That see that would have been perfect. I'm I'm amazed no one thought of that. <laughs> they could have called it like droid fluid or something like that, mm. or or star milk. I guess it would be star milk, right? Um, you don't want to know where it actually comes from, but star milk, you know, whatever. We can go with that. I mean, they made C three POs for Horik's sake. Exactly. With, you're gonna have three C three POs and droid milk or so whatever you call it, R two D milk or whatever. That would have been the most disgusting food product ever. <laughs> I, I remember even as a kid I could not choke back the C three POs. I never even tried. <laughs> I, I wasn't into sugary cereal, so I couldn't yeah. I, weren't they just like super sugary like Cheerios or something? Yeah, like they, they turned to mush just as soon as you put milk on them. And they were so sugary, you could feel the veins in the side of your head just like vacillating as you're eating this stuff. 
Awesome. <laughs> it was, it was, wow. It was, t- and they didn't even have good prizes in them. That was the worst part. Yeah, that was back in the day when cereal boxes had prizes. Do they still have prizes? I don't eat cereal. I haven't for like a decade or two. For the most part, no. Every now and then, they something pops up, but they haven't really since the early 2000s. I don't think they've put prizes in, in cereal. Ah, there's a lost marketing opportunity. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but they must have had their reasons. Oh, well. But so, so anyway, so yes, Star Wars, Star Trek, where they had food cubes back in the original series. Yeah. <laughs> um, mind you, I mean, they do, a, the next gen did actually have some real food occasionally. I mean, I think uh, Jean-Luc Picard did amazing things for Earl Grey tea. Whoever <laughs> made Earl Grey tea probably thanks that man every, every Christmas. I mean... They must they were, there must be a shrine to him in the Earl Grey tea factories or something. <laughs> yeah, that's true, isn't it? And of course, what other food, famous food products do we have? Uh, we have Bill Cosby and Jello. Okay. Although I guess that would be more food. Would, would that fall into your third category then? Because it's not exactly um, it's not something that they actually ate inside the show. Yeah, yeah. Like for for food mm. in entertainment, it, it's that idea that what the characters eat and what you eat in universe is is part of the story right okay all right then well let's sticking with that so let's so let's see some other examples of food i mean obviously we tend to go nerds so star wars star trek that kind of thing um a lot of shows just have them eating what basically amounts to normal food they just don't bother to reference it or anything like that. Just the characters sit down and they have do their scene while they're pretending to eat, or sorry, where they're you know eating, and then that's it. The food itself doesn't really mean much. Yeah, it's it's one of the it it doesn't the the first category there doesn't happen too often, and even when you have characters eating in a story, they're probably not eating. They're just sort of sitting in proximity to dinner and passing it around. Yeah, it's usually how it goes. Yeah, the only time it really comes up, and even mm-hmm. then, it's pretty rare. Is if um, if the food product itself or the idea of gaining nourishment is important to the plot. Oh, I can think of one other way it comes up. Okay, food product placements, especially when, for example, they have to drink Fresca or whatever. <laughs> you know, the characters are basically drinking an ad. You yeah, know, within the story, they they make a point of paying a little bit of attention to it because they have to. Yeah, that's true, and that's that's kind of one of the whole things Top Gun was based on. I think we've talked about that before. Mm-hmm. Could you show that Pepsi machine again? But even then, mm-hmm. it's not really integral to the story. It just you'll get scenes where characters will engage in snacking, mostly just to show the product, like you said. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that and. It's an excuse to show the product. Yeah, and and it makes me laugh because I can remember when you go to the seventies, early eighties. If you had an actual product on your show, they had to blank out the, uh, they'd blank out the the the, the logo or the the branding. Mm-hmm. That that was something that was was verboten up until somebody got the idea. Wait, we can make this an ad within the show, and then everybody did it. Well, yeah, because then they can go to the food companies and say, will you give us money to have your product on the show? Yeah. I mean, it literally became a source of revenue, so why the hell wouldn't they do it? Yeah. I mean, I think the Japanese did it way before we did, because I can remember anime has, like, food references to it, and older Japanese shows do as well. I think it was kind of okay for them. Then again, a lot of the studios are connected with the uh, food production companies in Japan, because they're all interlinked, right? So. Yeah. It probably works out that way. Yeah. The... But but speaking of that, um, I should know that, of course, that is a North American culture. Mm-hmm. I mean, Asian culture, because they're so obsessed with food, they do sh- whole shows and series about food. Um, like, for example, there's one on Netflix that you can see called Tokyo Midnight Diner, which is an amazing anthology series, which more or less the whole point of the show is is – why something that the diner serves is a comfort food for that character that week. And Mm. there's no magic. There's no mystical elements to it. It's just like the character comes in and usually tends to love or order this one food. And we find out why through like flashbacks and flash asides and whatever else we find out basically why that food is so important to that person and why it's such an important part of their life in some way. Right. And then there's another one called bartender 
which where the guy serves a drink to people and then we find out why that drink is so important. If I remember right, it basically goes that they'll go in and they'll be served this drink and then the person will freak out because this drink is like weirdly important in their life. <laughs> and then they basically and the then they'll explain to the bartender why because they're so amazed that he gave them the exact right drink at the exact right time. Um, and there's all kinds of stuff like that. Like Asians will do whole series. I mean, people know about Iron Chef comes from Japan and that idea as uh, food and food preparation is entertainment, but I'm not talking about that because that's the second category. I'm talking about one where, to them, food is such an important part of their culture and their life, China, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, all these places, that they make a point of it. Like, the food and the food they eat means something. It represents something to the story. It's another element of their story and of their environment and that the story plays with. Whereas in North America... We almost seem to ignore food. Like we really don't have a it like it's just something that's just a background element. Yeah, ignore in a lot of ways we tend to be afraid of it. Afraid of it? What do you mean? Um, like I said, it only comes up in our stories if it's really kind of integral to the plot. And then a lot of times where you'll see out of horror movies mm, where oh, okay. it, where it'll be like to the monster we're food. Right. Or the food will be evil. Like, um, best example of that is The Stuff. I was going to say The Stuff. <laughs> classic film there. <laughs> Where the earth is destroyed by evil yogurt. Yep, yep. But, exactly. But that's that's how we, we tend to do it. Like, it's... it's uh, Or um, there's numerous episodes with some kind of food product that everybody likes, but far too much, and it causes problems. Like, uh, um, there was The Simpsons when the um, the school put vending mm -hmm. machines in and then all the kids were like getting fat because they're eating nothing but junk food out of the vending machines we'll do things like that but it's always that food is to be feared right yeah the idea that too much food is bad for you so it's it's there as a message basically yeah or that some kind of food or or edible is going to doom you like that that idea that the uh the the machines in the school were were like essentially brainwashing the kids into eating more crap. Right. Okay. I mean, we do do food stuff sometimes. Like, for example, there's there's been many sitcoms that were set in bars, for example. I mean, mm -hmm. Cheers is the most obvious one, but there was the George Carlin one, and there's been others as well. There's been, there's been uh, sitcoms that were set at restaurants yeah. as well. We've had that kind of thing. But the consumption doesn't generally... It's not a part of the story. Like, yeah, that's true. Like it'll be set in a restaurant, but doing restaurant things and and cooking and that doesn't come up. It's just an excuse to get these like sassy waitresses together and banter with the customers. Like the actual food part of it doesn't come into into play very much. Mm, maybe on rare occasions someone will love that pie or something like that or be there for a Flo's coffee. Yeah, but that's about it. Yeah, you kind of hit upon there. There's two other incidences where food comes up in 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 like North American entertainment, mm -hmm. and in both cases they have to do with violence and mayhem. Because okay, because the one you kind of you you, you kind of reminded me of is the idea of the pie fight or the food fight, right? Like we do that a lot. That's about as close as can to consum like like consumption as you get, but it's it's only after the hunt when you plaster that other guy with with coconut cream, mm -hmm. and in a weird way, kind of tying into that is post apocalypse. Oh yes, that's true. Where food as a resource is important, and in theory, and but what you find again, a lot of lip service gets paid to that. Mm. So that's why, like you know, Stallone eating the rat burger. In um in Demolition Man is more it's a joke than anything else, right? And you get things. The best example would be say the Hunger Games movies. Mm -hmm. Hunger is in the title. It's about like the evil overlords starving out the the side communities. And I'm thinking those people like I don't see rickets or scurvy or anything. Those people are remarkably well fed for people in a starving you know dystopia. Well, the books actually have recipes in them. Mm -hmm. The books, like the main character actually makes food and they teach you the recipes. For rat? Like, 
No, not oh. for rat. I mean, they're eating actual relatively normal food. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, you're right. You would think, okay, Hunger Games, but there isn't actually a whole, I guess, hungry for power? I mean, I, I, I'm not quite sure what they're supposed to be hungry for during those games, or maybe they just don't feed them during the games. <laughs> the idea is that they're, they're pushed forward by the lack of food or something like that. Well, it's, it's again, it's that idea that all post-apocalypse settings pay lip service to that idea of, of having mm-hmm. to find sustenance. But unless it's an important part of the plot, like unless Max has to like be starving in the desert and rescued half alive, it doesn't come up even in, in um, like we've talked mm-hmm. about role-playing games and stuff. Right. Yeah. Very few role-playing games, especially in, including post-apocalypse or fantasy games where you're going to be walking a lot because everybody follows the Tolkien model. A lot mm-hmm. of games don't have rules for starvation. You know, I never really thought about that, but you're right. They don't. Yeah. Yeah. Cause and, and in a way I think it's where you said, like say an Asian culture, Mm. They're more likely to involve the process of food and eating into the stories that because they see that as essential to life. In like Western culture, it's almost like we have a fear of losing it, that it's such a primal fear of starvation that we can't really bring ourselves to get too close to that idea. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I, I think so. Well, there actually, I. Western culture is a tricky one because I would say I don't think Europeans have a problem with it because remember, Mm. you know, thanks to the wars and everything like that, they experienced starvation only like a generation or two ago. Like, you know, they've experienced like food rationing and starvation and such. It's North Americans that the idea of uh, not being able to eat, of lack of food is so scary and so anathema to them that they really don't, they don't even want to see it. Yeah. Like that idea is just verboten you just can't talk about it yeah and i mean maybe it's just maybe north americans are the most food obsessed of all after all uh that's an interesting point though you would think that for example in D D, did they never publish rules about how, what monsters are edible and what ones aren't well yeah that that doesn't come up at all i think there's just a couple references um in early versions that certain monsters are poisonous if you eat them Right. But again, the rules for like starvation and that don't really make an appearance until I think it's like the wilderness survival guide. Well, that would make sense. But that's, that's like mid eighties. You're looking like over 10 years since the game came out. Well, it's presumed that the characters are wandering around with rations, right? And water skins and crap. Right. That they're actually able to use to keep themselves alive. Because I guess the whole point is, is that they're not adventuring over such a long period that they can't get away with just rations, right? Yeah, but the catch is, and this is where, again, we kind of pay lip service to that, because remember, rations and, and water skin and that are, mm-hmm. are official equipment in the D&D equipment list. They have been since pretty much the yeah, beginning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And some of the adventures, you're going really far, like the uh, old um, uh, Descent into the Depths of the Earth. Right. Your characters are traveling for, for a very long time, over miles and miles of distance. Right. In this, That's a good point. In this weird underground like kingdom that, that it, it's it, anybody who's familiar with newer D&D, it's kind of the prototype for the Underdark. Mm-hmm. That there's a whole other like society that lives in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in the catacombs, as it were. Right. And again, there's some lip service paid. There's recommendations that they can find water and stuff and you can eat some of the fungus and blah, blah, blah. But, but like I say, it's never a big component of things. Right. Even, even when it should be, when you'd think this would be a thing, mm. it doesn't come up that often. Yeah, I can see that. I guess I guess the logic has always been it gets in the way of the fun and the fantasy, right? Remember, yeah. Fantasy is ultimately fun fantasy. It's not meant to be grim, dark Warhammer fantasy. It's meant to be fun. You know, the characters are not supposed to be worrying about that basic stuff. Yeah. And even Warhammer fantasy, I don't think, had rules for starving, but chances are you're going to be killed by, like, a random meteor or something well before then, yeah. so it doesn't matter. That's true. Actually, that's one of the reasons why I was so amazed. There's, um, I think in English it's called Delicious in the Dungeon. Oh, yeah. In, in Japanese, it's Dungeon Meishi, which was one of my favorite manga for a while. <laughs> um, because because yeah, it's literally a comic book Jap- manga, Japanese comic, about a bunch of adventures 
going on a long quest through an, uh, as you said, a great underground dungeon civilization. And so they're having to cook up all the monsters that they're encountering to survive. <laughs> well, it's not just that. It's 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 the idea that they're going in because there were stories of that where they're looking for specific monsters because they're a delicacy. <laughs> yeah, that's true, too. Because <laughs> there's there's another one. Uh, Toriko is like that. Yes. It's a guy yeah, who like kills giant monsters just to eat them. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, wow, that looks delicious. Let's kill it. Well, yeah, and then they'll be like, in the mountains is this giant legendary whatever, and it's killed a hundred people. I'm going to go and chop its legs off and cook them because I got this recipe out of a magazine or something. (laughs) I think I prefer the delicious in the dungeon version, but yeah, Toriko was pretty popular too. I don't know if it's still running or not, but it ran forever. Yeah. But even even then, even the, the dungeon one, that is such a weird, weird... It's weird and mm-hmm. it's surprising that nobody thought of that before. It is. It is. That, and see, that's what I'm talking about, about Japanese Asian food culture. Mm-hmm. Like, they really do integrate the food culture into their stories. And they think of things like that. It's yeah. just a weird aside. And even when you read, like, their like their web novels and light novels and stuff, it's amazing how often food comes up. Like, there's actually a light novel series... And this is true. This is, I'm not kidding when I say this. I'm scared. It's, uh, it's about a guy who gets reincarnated as a vending machine. <laughs> okay. So he gets reincarnated in a fantasy <laughs> setting as a vending machine. Uh-huh. Not a talking vending machine, just a vending machine. <laughs> Although I think he does figure out how to communicate. And he also discovers that he's like can be mag- he can magically it's one of those weird things where he can magically refresh his stock. Like he can choose what stock he has in himself mm-hmm. and like it will magically appear. He can like spend people will pay him in money, he can use that to generate magic points or something, and then he can restock the machine. Right. And other and characters in, and he actually makes friends with like adventurers and shit because they're because he's like the ultimate dispensary basically and so they start carrying him around uh-huh. on adventures. I'm not kidding. There are actual pictures from it of like the adventurers with like a sling and they carry this vending machine around <laughs> and he and he he interacts with them sort of and um, but the thing is he's capable of providing them like bandages or things that they need at the right time. But a big part of it's also food. Like figuring out what food he's going to have, mm-hmm. and there's other, there's other, uh, there's another light novel series which is about a chef who gets stuck in a, um, who goes, who gets stuck in a fantasy world, the usual, and then yeah, he op- he opens a restaurant. That's that's all he does. He doesn't go on a great adventures or anything like that. He opens a restaurant and creates a restaurant empire. Uh huh. <laughs> that's 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 the story. Then there's another one that was super popular, and in fact, they even did several lot seasons of a live action TV series called Nobunaga's Chef, mm-hmm. which is about a modern day French Japanese ja- Japanese chef who specializes in French cuisine, who gets transported back into the Warring States period. Right, and so to survive, he starts demonstrating his cooking skills, and he quickly becomes the chef personal chef of Oda Nobunaga, who's the great warlord who's conquering Japan. Mm -hmm. And so we get all this, these stories connected with food and how he uses food to support Nobunaga and um, gets involved in things and stuff like that. But it's his cooking skills that let him do that. And he's cooking specific dishes that let him get involved. Like the Japanese really take the whole idea of food and story and integrate it in, in ways that I've never seen anyone else do. Like seriously, they... They will do it in so many weird ways, but the Koreans and Jap and the Chinese will do some of this too. But the Japanese are kind of kings of it. Yeah, like when you mentioned that, um, then spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't read it, the uh, Doctor Stone comic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that yeah that, and 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 here comes the spoiler. Cover your ears for the next thirty seconds. Where in order to like solidify the beginnings of his empire of science. He reinvents ramen, and that's how he lures the primitive people of the future time in to, like, working for him with with ramen noodles. No, not just ramen. Ramen and Coca-Cola. I haven't got that far yet. Oh, okay, never mind. (laughs) Really? Really? You got stuck at the ramen? That's how far back you are? Well, they've only... I've been buying the uh, volumes as they come out. Oh, 
Okay, never mind. I'm one of the anyway. So <laughs> sorry, I spoiled <laughs> something. Anyway, don't worry. Doctor Stone is like you can start listening again, people. Doctor Stone, <laughs> actually, Doctor Stone just won like a Best Manga of the Year award mm-hmm. in Japan too. It like won basically Best Manga of like 2018, I think it was. I think Shogaku Khan's like prize or there's some big big prize or whatever. Anyway, short version, Best Manga of the Year, and it really is mm-hmm. like. Dr. Stone just gets better and better and better. Like, there's no other way to describe that book. Like, it is, like... And it's so beautifully entertaining. It's so beautifully... Oh, wait, I should probably tell people what Dr. Stone is, just in case. Mm -hmm. Um, Dr. Stone is a story about... Basically, short version is this. Everyone on Earth gets turned to stone by some mysterious effect, and I believe animals do as well. And so... After a couple thousand years, um, the main characters wake up, um, and they basically the stone crumbles off them. They get they actually get they get turned back to flesh, and so now it's this post apocalyptic world. And so the main character Senku, who's like this science genius, basically sets about reinventing civilization one step at a time using science, mm-hmm. and um, it's pretty incredible. Mm-hmm. It's pretty. It's it's pretty incredible how he. Uh, every, every episode is how he solves different problems using science, and for the most part, it's fairly good science too. I mean, he's made the author has made a few little scientific errors now and then, but they're not big ones for the most part. Mm-hmm. They're ones that only you have to actually be a scientist to catch, and I'm not. I've just you know I just read the comments and such on them, um, but for the most part, it's amazing. Yeah, like it. It really is. It's fantastic. And it's all about creativity and science and developing, and there's a little bit of action and fighting in it, but not much. It's more about the character solving problems through knowledge and science and determination and such. It's, it's really, really neat. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it will probably be a super mega hit that all of you will be familiar with when it comes out in English because there's an anime coming – well, the an- comic's coming out, but the anime is coming out next summer. By fall 2019, I have a feeling that – Everyone will know what Doctor Stone is. Like I have little doubts it will be, it will probably have the same effect that One Punch Man did. Yeah, because again, like One Punch Man, it doesn't look like everything else. It's very unique, and, and but it's equally awesome. Yes, and not super cutesied up. Oh my god, I wish they'd stop. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. Exactly. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's fantastic. It really is. It's and I see it being a mega hit, especially once the anime hits. It's already a mega hit as a manga, so why yeah. not, right? Um, so anyway, we got off track, but but <laughs> yes, food actually ends up being uh, a component of that story a couple times. The the example you gave, and there'll be later examples as well, because mm-hmm. again, food is really important. Like it's really really important to our life. Like it's one of the most basic things. Like food, sleep, sex, shelter. Like it's one of the top four, right? Mm-hmm. And yet we maybe top three, um, but we don't seem to focus on that in North America. Maybe because maybe it goes back to that idea that you brought up a long time ago. The idea that we can't stand weakness in North American pop culture. Yeah, like we avoid anything that re- could be seen as weak. So characters don't need to sleep, they don't need to pee, they don't need to really eat. Mm-hmm. It's not a big deal to them because they're too busy going out and ignoring their humanity and ignoring their basic needs to solve the problems of the world, I guess, or whatever. Or bitch to each other and sleep with each other's wives, I don't know. It, it's true, too, because the only other time that eating really comes up in North American entertainment is the character that eats too much and it's presented as a character flaw. Mm. yep that's true which again it implies like you were saying that that need for sustenance is somehow some kind of weakness exactly yeah it it really is portrayed as you said earlier it's a it's a weakness food is considered a weakness on our part in north american culture Mm -hmm. which with the more you more i think about it is the weirder it gets yeah that why is that the case why are we so afraid of food hmm and that's the only thing I can come up with is it goes back to the fear of weakness, yeah. which I think we'll probably have to do a show on sometime about, or ha- yeah, we haven't done one on that, have we? About just, we've talked a little bit about it, but we've never done an actual show on weakness in culture. That's true. We did one on strength though. So maybe we kind of covered that in that episode. It hmm. could. I think 
part of the problem we get in North America, which is going to come up later on this episode, why we're afraid of food would be like Crinkles the Clown. Okay, yeah, we'll get to that in a little bit. <laughs> All right, so we should probably move on. So that okay. was food in entertainment. We might come back a little bit to that, but let's move on overall to food as entertainment. Right. Which goes back to the whole idea of, which I mentioned earlier, I, I blame Iron Chef. Right. Like, I mean, we've always had cooking shows. Yeah. Right? But it wasn't until Iron Chef came around and everybody went nuts for it back in, like, the 90s, I think it was, where basically suddenly people were like, holy crap, cooking food can be, like, real, actual competitive entertainment. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the Food Network went from being a show where they taught you how to make, like, waffles and Chinese food and stuff uh, to being... You know, the food battle network. <laughs> well, yeah, because then it's cool because, like, you're fighting. Exactly. Like, it all became about competitive food where it's like, okay, we're going to give these chefs, like, this basket of random crap and they're <laughs> going to have to make a dinner out of it and right. stuff like that. And that literally became, like, that's Chopped, by the way. That's an actual show. Um, <laughs> that, like, I, I, I confess, I actually watch a lot of, uh, or I shouldn't say watch, watched. I watched a lot of uh, like competitive food shows. I, I was into Hell's Kitchen for a while there, which is not exactly a competitive food show, but tries to be. Mm -hmm. um, Iron Chef fan. Oh, Cutthroat Kitchen. Cutthroat Kitchen is like <laughs> was my favoritest one for a while there. Like, oh my God, I was obsessed with Cutthroat Kitchen for a couple of years there. Um, Cutthroat Kitchen, in case anyone doesn't know, shame on you, um, is hosted by Alton Brown, who's uh, another guy who made food into entertainment. And um, basically what he did is, is that it's a show where there's uh, four chefs and they basically, they have to make a dish, but, and they're given, like, they're told, okay, here's the dish and there's a kitchen over there. But then before they go, they get to bid up some of their prize money. They get to sacrifice their own potential prize money to sabotage each other. Like there are, there are sabotages that come up, like the one of the classics that, I've always been fond of is the, okay, they've got to make a cake. Well, so one of the sabotages is, is that if you get, if you, and they, they bid on it, it's an auction was that they're one of the, one of the chefs would have to bake their cake in like an easy bake oven. <laughs> uh -huh. that, that way, or, you know, other ones where they have to do the whole thing where two chefs are like, they're like, uh, they're like tied together at the waist or something like that, but they both have their separate stations. They both have to figure out how to do it and lay a lot of time, things like that. And so they did all these sabotages against each other. And it, it, it amazing show really is. I just kind of burnt myself out on it because I watched way too much of it. But it, it's a fantastic, funny series. Mm -hmm. And then they get whatever money they have left at the end. So that was that was a very smart idea, the idea that they bid on it. Anyway, but I learned a huge amount of cooking. Like that show taught me, I will confess, a massive amount because you see these chefs having to come up with different ways to get around make like they don't have key ingredients for example and they have to find out using the ingredients they do have they have to like make something i very quickly learned that eggs flour and milk are like the universal things you can make almost anything with them if you really really <laughs> have to well, oh yeah. and butter butter is also incredibly important like it's astounding <laughs> what people manage to make on that show in an hour just using those plus a few other things because they have to make an actual dish that they're told to make just and all the sabotages are designed to be ones that they can get around like there are different ways to get the dish done around them they just have to be clever about it which is why i loved it so much hmm. uh and so anyway, but that's an example of food as entertainment, yeah. right? I mean, the food itself, you know, and then a judge would eat it and such and say which one did it best. But the point is, is that the food, preparation of food becomes entertainment. And there's a whole network devoted to that. Yeah. More than one, in fact. Yeah, it, it kind of was because you mentioned we've had cooking shows for as long as we had like television, I think. I suspect there were cooking shows on radio. Maybe. I'm, I'm betting there were. I don't know that for certain, but some I'm sure some radio historian can write in and let us know for sure. But I'm betting there were sure that, you know, they gave them instructions about how to do it. They couldn't see, but they give, you know, the housewives and such instructions back in the 30s and 40s about how to cook different dishes. Yeah. And and banter. It was all about the... Oh, yes. Yeah. A lot of them were kind of low-key comedy acts. Yes, that's true. 
So you get things like, uh, was it Yen, Ken, Cook, or things oh, like that. A lot of them Yen. are, yeah, Cock, Walk with Yen. Yeah, yeah, Walk with Yen. There we go. Um, I think, actually, I think there was a show called Yen, Ken, Cook, or was that his book? And Walk with Yen was the show, well, something like that. Walk with Yen but was anyway. the show, because I know that, because I used to watch that when I was a kid, because he was funny. Right, and that's the point, right? A lot of them, basically, as you said, were comedy acts. The, a lot of these food people were really low-key comedians, basically. Mm-hmm. So they're not that low-key. I mean, and that's how they kept you entertained. And some of them, um, they still do this today. We'll have, uh, they'll have guests on yeah. in each episode or something. Like they'll have guest celebrities or other guests come on to help them out who they think might be entertaining and so they can banter back and forth with them. Yeah. So there'll be all that kinds of stuff. And, I mean, th- oh, that became a big part of popular culture. I think, I think it was Julia Child that really helped popularize that. Yeah, she's the first one that everybody remembers anyway. Because she, made right. a, even if people don't remember, because you've seen some comedian do an impression of her, but you didn't know that that's what they were doing. Mm, exactly. Exactly. And so, yeah, she helped popularize that. So maybe I'm wrong about the radio thing. I think she was on TV in like either the 60s or the 70s. She was the celebrity chef of the era. Definitely and the then, 60s. The, okay, it was the 60s? Okay. And then, and she taught a whole generation how to cook, basically. Um, and how to cook French cuisine and other stuff like that. And so we went on from there. And then uh, very quickly, every cable access channel, basically, or pu- you know, public broadcaster in the States, basically had a cooking show after that. Yeah. And they went from there. Yeah, because I was, I think in, um, uh, most of which is the French Chef premiered 1963. Oh, there we go. She did a, uh, she did a uh, cookbook prior to yes. that. Yeah, she, her cookbook was very famous. Because mm-hmm. that's the thing, I think when you talk about like uh, the Iron Chef style shows, I think that kind of made cooking okay. Because you'd win money. And like we said on the show, as soon as like you make money doing something, People in North America think that it's okay. <laughs> well, people always thought cooking was okay because you could make money running a restaurant, right? Yeah. But I can see kind of your point because now that I think back on it, you could and people kind of respected it back in the you know back in the old day pre Iron Chef days. People would kind of respect chefs, mm-hmm. but I think there was still this idea that you know that cooking was still not a real man's job. Like, I think there was some idea there that that cooking wasn't, like, a real celebrity status thing or something like that. Like, it wasn't a... How can I phrase this? Like, because I remember lots of stereotypes of, like, you know, the wacky French chef and things mm-hmm. like that. That you would see chefs were almost something to be mocked a little bit in cult, in popular culture. Yeah, because what, what... It was, again, that I, I think what you're, you're, you're seeing is it was that idea that cooking and eating was something that needs to be done but we didn't laud in it mm, exactly and you go especially say like the, the the stereotypical french chef from the 50s or the 60s always had a bad temper and was kind of full of himself yep. and i think it was that idea that you had that they were trying they were seen as characters that were bringing trying to bring undue gravitas to something that's essentially just like what you do exactly and then it's like is it's just making food, man. What's with all this crap? Yeah, like, and that's, you know, you don't have to go to school for that. You just cook. What the hell? And then, exactly. And then when you got to, like, yeah, the 90s and you got, like, the competitive cooking shows because it was a game show and you could win money, that made it mm-hmm. okay because shortly after that, you also had, like, the weird food-based travelogue shows. Yes, yes, you did. Um, and you started getting uh, people, yeah, traveling all over the world eating stuff. And trying different foods and everything. Yeah, and and then that became that became a thing around that time, and that's when everybody started noticing. Wait, there's a Food Network. Yeah. Well, that's true, and I think the Food Network actually still does pretty well. I think it, it's it became popular during like the two thousands, and I think it's still fairly popular anyway. Yeah. Um. I I know we have a Canadian version. There's the American version. I've watched the I've watched. There's more than one Food Channel in Asia. Surprise. Mm. Um. And. Um, yeah, no, no, and I think I think that's true. I mean, one guy I give at least some credit. Well, there, are, I think. Okay, correction. There are two people I give a lot of credit to this too. Right. Um, and uh, they are first uh, Gordon Ramsay. Yeah. I would give Ramsay actually some credit for this uh, because 
Ramsey, despite being the you know, that crazy British chef, also showed that being a chef and that can be damn cool. And uh, he went around, and he of course went around to different restaurants, like showing how much of a hard work it is to be a chef, mm -hmm. and like fixing restaurants and doing all these different kinds of sh cooking shows for his little empire. So I think Ramsay definitely helped with it. The other one was Anthony Bourdain, and Bourdain I think was even added even before uh, Ramsay was. Because I know Bourdain even back in the '90s was a celebrity chef in New York, I think if I remember right. Okay. Like, and he wrote books about his experiences as a chef. And Bourdain uh, did, I, God knows how many seasons of his show, Traveling Around the World, Eating Stuff. Mm -hmm. um, he did different versions of that show. I remember watching his show back in like 2004 when I was living in Taiwan. So I know it was on back then. And that it wasn't new even at that point. And of course, unfortunately, Bourdain just passed away uh, like a year or so back. But yeah. um, the point is, again, that Bourdain did an incredible amount towards promoting how food culture is cool. Like food yeah. culture is a major part, um, and and then of course uh, there was also um, the guy I mentioned earlier. Oh my god, I can't believe! Oh my god, I'm seeing. Um, <laughs> oh, then of course there was also Alton Brown, who I mentioned earlier, who with who did his uh, show about. Um, Oh, what was his show called? I can't remember. But anyway, I'll, I'll link to it in the show notes. He did a really popular show on the Food Network where he, each episode was about the best ways to cook a different type of dish. Mm. And uh, so he went through and he taught a ton of people how to cook and showed how cooking could be a really cool and interesting part of your life. How cooking is like could be a real skill and a hobby and everything. And yeah. anyway, so again, he popularized food as entertainment. Yeah, I think Gordon Ramsay piggybacked on the idea that we had a lot of those weird talent shows at the time. Mm, and true. Al almost all of them seem to feature a British guy who yells at you till you cry. Yes, and he I definitely pi piggybacked on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because that seemed to be a thing. Because when you talk about this, what kind of happens with the idea of, of, of food and food-based entertainment is it hits that point where it's kind of, it's aspirational and inspirational at the same time. Mm, I agree. Like it's 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 that idea that when all of these shows take over, like with the Iron Chef, it's competitive, but it kind of puts that idea in people's heads that yeah, mm -hmm. this is a skill. This is something you can do something. Yes, with. you can. Yep. You can. You you don't just follow a recipe. You can kind of kind of be your own thing. And then mm -hmm. the other guys like the Travelog shows that tie into that weird thing. That in North America, in your leisure time, there's only two things you're allowed to do that society as a whole considers worthwhile. Mm -hmm. And that's sports and traveling. Right. And that's I true. think I think it tied into that 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 I and I don't understand why, but that idea that in your spare time, if you want to travel, that's that's a good thing. And then tying into that weird mythology linking eating to traveling gives it a little bit more a little bit more gravitas right for whatever oh, one, reason when yeah. note the show i was thinking of with alton brown is good eats good eats oh. was the show that he uh that he pioneered and was was very important for food culture for a while there um uh, back okay. in the 2000s it was anyway um but going back to your point though um yes actually i think in north american culture i think traveling is important uh because north americans we have so much land and like, you know, the, this place is so big and there's so many different environments and places. Yeah. The idea of traveling is a very natural part of our life because we don't live kind of crammed together, right? So the idea that you travel to different places and it makes you more worldly and makes you more aware of the world and uh, uh, how can I put this, a broader human being. And I don't mean that in the sense of the eating a lot broader. I mean, <laughs> uh, I mean, it makes you um, more aware of your place in the world. And yeah, there's that yeah. idea of traveling. I, I wonder if a little bit of it actually also comes from World War II. Mm -hmm. Because remember, there's an entire generation of American men that traveled. Yeah. Like they went off to Europe, they saw other countries, and then they came back. And so they knew the idea of, they knew the value, even if it was going off to another country to shoot people, that you actually get from traveling to another place and experiencing other ways of life. Mm -hmm. They could see the value in that. And I think they brought that back. I mean, I know my mother tells the story of that my grandfather, who 
was not a World War II veteran, but um, they, when she was young and they had a car, this is back in like the, what, 50s and 60s. It'd be mostly, yeah, 50s and 60s. Um, they would, my grandparents loved to take them traveling. Like to them and everybody else, traveling was the thing that you did in the 50s yeah. and 60s. You, you loaded the kids and the family up in the car and you drove off for a couple of weeks. Like just the act of driving somewhere was like the most amazing and coolest thing ever. That was what the family did. And so you try, and so my mother has been all over the continent, and that's it's just because my grandfather wanted to drive all over the continent, and any excuse to go off and take off in the car and go someplace was a big deal. Yeah. And so I see. So I think that is. I'm not sure where it comes from, but you're right. I think that traveling is an important part of North American culture, just as you said. And just to piggyback, I think that if you piggyback, eating is part of that, and that's where things get interesting, right? Because in Asia, and I know, hell, this is just Asian culture. I'll just go with it in general. Um, you could, there are whole sections in bookstores that are just about, here are food guides for different places. Like their travel section is, is half food books. It's, half <laughs> list, it's literally like just collections of books about restaurants in different areas. So if you go here, there's, here's like the barbecue tour. If you go to this city, you try that rest, barbecue, that restaurant, that restaurant. Like there's all these reviews and guides and everything. But their whole schedules and plans are all based around eating. Like they plan vacations based on food and hitting <laughs> different restaurants and places like that. Right. Like North Americans, we'll, we'll plan ours based on, well, I see the Grand Canyon or I go to Las Vegas and I, and you know, you, you eat some food on the way. That's just a given, right? But the, the Asians will go to a place just to eat the food. Hmm. To them, a restaurant is a destination in and of itself if it has some kind of special food. Right. Like I said, food culture is such a part of their lives and it just isn't part of ours. Or hasn't been anyway. Or, or yeah, like I say, it kind of half-assedly has been here. Like, it's it's one of those things that's always kind of been in the background. But, yeah, that we've never, we very seldom, you, you don't think of it until you're running out kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, basically, yeah, exactly. Food, okay, well, there's always just stuff you can, you know, fill your pie hole with. And that's that's it. You know, it's something mm -hmm. you just put in there. But I have, you know, I will say watching those, you know, food shows and also being exposed to like the Asian culture and the, has made me appreciate food a lot more. Like I really do see the value of food much more than I used to when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy cooking more. I do more cooking myself. It inspires me to try cooking and try different things. I, I've always been able to cook. But um, I'm one of those kids who actually wanted to learn. I got my mother to teach me how to cook when I was young because I thought it was fascinating. And I'm not a great cook, but I'm okay. And I, I've always thought that was it, but now I cook more than I ever did partly because of like food shows and, and that I appreciate food much more than I did before. Hmm. And I also appreciate where it comes from as well. That's an odd side effect of it as well, that you start, you kind of appreciate where the food, the origins of food, like you right. look at the origins of food and say, well, where is this coming from? Like what makes this product better than that product and things like that. Hmm. Like I will sit and watch on like NHK world. I'll sit there and watch like documentaries about like brewing soy sauce and things like that. And <laughs> I actually find them interesting. Well, a it's NHK world. So their, their documentaries are usually pretty interesting in general, but, but yeah, it's actually interesting stuff to me. It's like, Oh, that's how they do that. And that's what makes that soy sauce different than that soy sauce. And things like, I really, I appreciate it more and more as I get older. Hmm. Again, maybe some of its age, right? When you're young, just anything that's sweet or salty and will do. But as you get older, you just have you, you just come to appreciate more and more. Plus, I think also one thing that's affected me is I have some food allergies and some food issues. And so as an end result, I have to be careful with what I eat. So it's forced me to pay attention to my diet a lot more than I might otherwise. And mm -hmm. sometimes be creative because some common foods and I don't get along very well. And so therefore I've had to look for alternatives and, and try out different foods that I might not normally have if I could have the staples. Right. So eh, just kind of the way, the way life works. Hmm. So uh, what kind of role does food have in your life, Don? I don't know. I'm one of them guys who eat just about anything. Okay. That's what I thought. Yeah. I'm not fussy. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so <laughs> I, I I understand. That's probably why a lot of this thing kind of seems that uh that it's uh a little baffling to me because like I said, I don't I don't get into it so much. Well, there's a catch though with you. If I remember right, you don't have a very strong sense of taste, do you? No, not really. So to you, food really does mostly just taste the same. Yeah, kinda. So whereas for many people who have a much stronger sense of taste, it's you know we you know be able to uh, feel and taste the different levels of uh, sweet and salty and sour and all the you know all that stuff can make food a really incredible experience. But if you mm. can't taste all that stuff or not very clearly, then yeah, I can see why food wouldn't be a big deal. Yeah, so that's kind of all right. So let's move <laughs> on then to uh, our sorry. I don't want to interrupt. Was there anything else about food as entertainment you want to bring up? No, it's kind of, again, it's, it's, it's one of those things that seems to have just taken off like recently, like this century kind of thing. Mm. There, it's there's funny been, to say this century. Sorry. It, it is. Cause yeah, <laughs> but, but we're old, so we can do that. Exactly. <laughs> We've been alive for multiple centuries. Don, think about that. <laughs> And yeah, sometimes I, I really feel like it too. Yeah, that's what I was just thinking, and it sure does feel that way some days. Yep. Just just when I'm conscious, that's the only time. But mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, it's 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 kind of the 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 third one, mm-hmm. the third kind of way of looking at it of food by entertainment is something I think in North America we're we're familiar with. Yes, yes, we are. I mean, yeah. who hasn't watched disturbing commercials with you know, with food <laughs> that's begging you to eat it? Yeah, that's just not right. But it's eat me, eat me, because like, uh. <laughs> the the food mascot thing really does seem to be a. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb. I'm going to say I think North America is where it got perfected. Yes, I would agree with that. Like I've seen examples from from like Europe or or Japan and that, and it never took the on the life that it did here, right? Um, because this is where it gets a little weird. Because you 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 ma- mascot. I try I tried looking up mm-hmm. what the earliest food based mascot is. Mm-hmm. Um. The oldest that I could find was, and still still around today, was Aunt Jemima. Oh, okay. Who starts in 1893. Wow, yeah. Um, the oldest like product mascot that I could find was from the 1880s, which is only like a decade or so earlier. Mm-hmm. And that was the Gold Dust Twins for uh, Gold Dust Washing Powder. That's technically not food, but okay. Sure, no, that's, well, that. that's that's the oldest mascot I could find. And okay, oh mascot. God. Period. Okay. Oh my god, is it crazy racist? Um, well, they usually <laughs> are, especially because yeah. it's 1880s. And then that that's the, the 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 Aunt Jemima at the time really isn't much better. But again, that was the 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 trend of the day. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right around that time, the turn of um, a century or two mm-hmm. ago, like the late 1800s, early 1900s, you start seeing this idea of a product mascot come around. Yes. And there's there's a bunch. The the Another really early food one was the Campbell's Soup Kids. Oh, right, yeah. And that's from like 1904. And I think wow. the way something like that happens, I think, is if you go back to the late 1700s going into the 1800s, Okay. Uh, you start seeing advertising in a form that we would recognize as advertising. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times there'll be an illustration. And you didn't... It's it's hard to peg when mascots happen because you didn't necessarily have a codified mascot for your product. But you'd probably use the same artist or the company you went to would use the same artist for their campaigns. Right. And they'd use set styles for different kinds of products. Mm-hmm. And because of that, you'll get designs that recur. Like the Campbell Soup Kids, you can find things that look like them from earlier. Right. But they're not them. It's just that that was a design style or possibly the same artist that was doing right. that material. 
Mm, makes sense. Yeah, this is the time when you're starting to get them. You're getting a mascot as a specific entity. Right. So like the camel. Well, so there's so there's a character involved. Yeah, yeah, and this is and this this is where I say this is where it it takes a weird turn because it looks like every few decades there's another big flare up mm-hmm. of of like food related mascots. Right. And every time there's a flare up, it seems like they get a little more entrenched. Mm-hmm. So you had the earliest ones. You had like a. You had like yeah, the, like the 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 soup kids. There was no story to them. Same thing like. Aunt Jemima, there was no story, there was no history. Mm -hmm. The next big kind of flare-up of this that you get seems to be around, like, the 50s going into the 60s. Okay. Where you're getting, you're getting more, like, food-based mascots, but what really takes off are the fast food mascots. Ah, right. Yes. Because you get, uh, the first fast food place, as far as I can see, was uh, A&W. Really? Yeah, nineteen nineteen. A and W's been around since nineteen nineteen. Yep. Really? I yep. I <laughs> wait. How does that work? I I mean, I thought that I I know McDonald's wasn't the first burger place, but I thought it was the first one of the early ones of its kind. Yeah, Mc, what A and W kind? Of, what were they? They were called something something else. They they weren't called A and W. They were. I mean, there have been hamburger places back in the, like the fifties and such. They weren't new exactly, but wow. Okay, I guess that might be a whole topic in and of itself. Yeah, but... that's that's what it is. It's a uh, Roy W. Allen opened a walk up root beer stand in Lodi, California. Okay, and it was it was we we oh they kind of have them nowadays too. I was gonna say for the kids today, picture a stationary food truck. Right, but, yeah. But it would be like just a little, like, almost like a little shack. And you'd walk yeah, yeah. up and you'd get... They still have them now. They they had more of them when, like, we were kids. I can remember them. But they were getting phased out by the fast food places. Right, yeah. And then, uh, 1926, that becomes like a franchise. I see. And then it kind of builds from there. Because as I recall, too, A&W is one of the first ones that really focused on uh, the automotive part of it. Yes, yeah. Well, they had the the drive up, like yeah. that's A and W. Isn't that the one where like the waitresses would be on wheels or whatever? They come out and serve you at the car anyway. Yeah, there were a bunch of places like that, but I do think it was A uh, and W was the first one that started catering to that idea to the the idea mm. of like mobile consumers. Cause, right, because that's sort of what leads to the idea of like food on the go, which becomes fast food. Right. Yeah. Which which then it takes off. That's where where uh, your McDonald's comes in, mm-hmm. because McDonald's is the one that kind of perfects that fast food formula. Yeah, makes sense. So, and 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 that it it's again it's so weird to look at because we don't really have fast food anymore. It's been dying out for the last few years. Hmm. True. But, yeah, but that used to be a big thing that you you could just go in. It wasn't like a, a sit-down restaurant. You just kind of run in, get something to eat, run out, or get it to go. Right. Which was where the drive-in part comes in. But uh, it seems to me when you get these, mm-hmm. you start getting mascots. Because what happens is McDonald's yep. creates Ronald McDonald. <sighs> yes, yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> and many children's nightmares are born. Well, oh my god, yeah, because what people don't realize is uh, Ronald McDonald previews in 1963. Mm-hmm. Um, they use him for, for like, uh, TV campaigns and that. It, he's played by Willard Scott. Okay, I didn't know that one. Yeah, and, and the funny thing is, Willard Scott a few years earlier played Bozo the Clown. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, he did, didn't he? And that was essentially what Ronald McDonald was. He was kind of this generic, oh my God, what the hell is that um, kind of clown? <laughs> and that's why he dresses so odd to differentiate it from Bozo, probably for copyright reasons. Yeah, if you see the original one, mm-hmm. he doesn't look he doesn't look like Ronald McDonald. The Ronald McDonald we know kind of comes about in 1967. Okay. Um, he looked like a generic... 
like 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 at the time he just looked like a Jarrett clown. We'll have to put like mm-hmm. links to some of the old ads. Right, um, sure. It, it's it's hard to explain. For some reason the early sixties, probably because of Bozo. Clowns mm-hmm. were everywhere and they were all terrifying. Of course, they're clowns. <laughs> Cause this was a couple of years before um um Kellogg's had sugar crinkles with uh Crinkles the Clown, which is the most soul drainingly terrifying looking thing ever. Mm-hmm. Like if they had to use that Crinkles the Clown for it in the the movies, people wouldn't go see it. They'd be too afraid to go see the film. Right. Yeah. And, and this is how we hawked food. But but yeah, that's yeah. I'm just creeped out thinking about uh fucking crinkles. But yeah, Ronald McDonald's kind of the first of these like fast food mascots. Mm-hmm. And that really kind of takes off. And this is where it gets weird because in the seventies, there's kind of another big push for this. And you probably remember this. And some mm-hmm. of our, our, our listeners who are around 40 and lived in North America, they create this big mythology around Ronald McDonald. Right. Yeah. He's not just there to, 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 to tell you how good the burgers are and threaten to murder your family. If you don't eat them, like all clowns do. Mm hmm. He lives in McDonald land and they invent yep. other characters and the characters all have these like weird backstories. Yeah. Yeah. Mayor McCheese, Grimace, the Hamburglar, all those characters. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and there's a ton of them. They are because they kind of come and go and they, they change a little bit because Grimace was originally a villain. I don't remember that actually. No, it was before our time. That was like the 60s that he was essentially the Hamburglar. Okay. And then apparently at some point he took a head wound and got a little confused and became that the would, Grimace we all know and love. That would be explain why he's called Grimace, which is an odd name for a, for a positive, like, lovable clown um, monster character. Yeah. Yeah, basically. <laughs> okay. No, that... Okay. No, no, I can see that. Yeah. This is where I, it starts this trend. Why, why, like we said, it's food by entertainment. Hmm. Because when you create McDonald's land, that's where it it becomes its own thing. Like, they start doing other products with these characters. There's toys. uh, Mm -hmm. There's comic books. The ads start taking on, like, a a vignette-style kind of presentation where there'll be, like, a story with, like, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Mm Mm-hmm. Usually not a complicated story. Oh, no, it'll be a very simple story, especially the ones that are meant for kids, you know, about usually the Hamburglar is up to something and Ronald McDonald <laughs> will you know, help some, save some kids' fries from the Hamburglar or something like that, and then they'll all settle in to eat some fries together. As, yeah. the, fry, as the fries say, eat me, thank you, Ronald, eat me, <laughs> eat me. Well, that's the, that's the weird thing, because if you remember the old ads, you would have, like, the puppet packages of fries that would talk, yeah. but then you'd have the actual fries. Are they different species? How about Mayor McCheese, who is a cheeseburger? Yeah, and then what was the cop's name? Oh, crap. Because um, I know who you mean. Yeah. Did they just call him Big Mac? Because he was a big, he had a, a Big Mac that was a head. But he was like he a... might have been... He looks like a, but he's dressed like a Bobby. He's dressed yeah. like a British Bobby or something like that. I know what you mean. Yeah, I don't know what he's called. Yeah, because there was a bunch of, like, again... This is the thing where the the marketing becomes more than just marketing. It becomes story. It's it's not taking advantage of the human brain's um, how we think in terms of story and character. It's it's not just appropriating that to sell food. It makes that shift into becoming story itself. Because there was oh, there was the mad scientist guy. Yeah, he was actually called Officer Big Mac. Okay, yeah. Yeah, because was... actually he's actually called Officer Big Mac. There, yeah, you're right. He's there's a uh, Captain Crook, who is oh, like yeah. this Hamburglar type character who I guess was just referred to as the Captain, who is obsessed with stealing filet fish sandwiches. Yeah, there's Grimace, um, the Hamburglar, who was originally called the Lone Jogger. That just couldn't <laughs> get any creepier. Oh my god, he's just he's just like the creepiest thing ever. He really is. <laughs> Should team up with Crinkles the Clown to haunt children's nightmares. And in the early 1970s, the Hamburglar's characteristic speech patterns were unintelligible to anyone but Captain Crook, who okay. was kind enough to translate for the inhabitants of McDonald Land. Yeah, because eventually were... he would issue forth with the exclamation of Robble Robble. 
Oh yeah, mm-hmm. okay, I remember that. Then there's the professor who you're talking about. Yeah. And they... he was the the mad professor. He was actually known as mm-hmm. okay. um Mary McCheese. And yeah, that's it basically. For a bit, and then they added Birdie and they added the uh oh, yep. uh, the fry something. The yeah, fry guys. the fry twins or something. Weren't there like well, there are three two of them? them? The three, three of them. They look, they look like a like a like a dust mop with legs, but I can't remember what they were called. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, and you then... don't want that hamburger jogging after you. That's just like wrong. <laughs> Somebody Sorry. call SVU. But yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, yep. <laughs> the Fry Kids, Officer Big Mac, Fry Kids. Oh, that was it. They the also Fry had, Kids. Yep. They had talking McNuggets at one point too. Yes, they did, didn't they? Yeah, because that was one when when they came out. That was one of the things that they did. That they started using these characters for for yeah as, as characters that you get like because the, the fry ones every like year or so they do a collection of like little toy ones that would have right. a theme that all be like sports guys or they all be like like Universal Monsters characters or something. Yes, I remember those. Yeah, yeah, they would. Yeah, mm-hmm. I remember. Also, by the way, there was also the Happy Meal Gang. I think were those just kids though. I don't think no the Happy Meal Gang. They're like uh, they're puppets. They look like hand puppets. They're like a burger, a fries, oh. a uh, cook, a shake, and a cookie. I think a cookies. Yeah. Okay. I and they're and the, the like the burger has a little bow tie thing on him. And yeah. They all have googly eyes and everything like that. And then there's Uncle o- Uncle O'Grimacy. Okay, that sounds That's like the for the, the, for the Shamrock changing. Shake. Oh, okay. He's, no, not just that. The yeah, the Phantom Jogger changed his mo to throw the cops off. <laughs> Uncle so Grimacy. No, there's the there's the sh- he's he's the character behind the Shamrock Shake. Okay. Yeah, the McNugget Buddies. I'd forgotten about them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because that and that, and that's where I see now. This is where to me things get weird. Hmm. Because. Around that that time, like this would be the early seventies, and you start seeing other companies doing the same thing, right? And that's where you get that weird proliferation, like you were saying about food that wants to be eaten, and that's disturbing. Mm-hmm. And oh, here's a weird thing. Sorry, the, the Fry Kids were originally known as Goblins. They were originally called Fry Goblins, who tried to steal other characters' French fries. Okay. They were actually introduced in the Wacky Adventures of Ronald McDonald commercials. And they, yeah, they were originally fry thieves. That was the whole deal with them. See, this is why you need more than one cop in your city. Otherwise, it's just crime runs rampant. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) See, that's... I do remember that. I do remember them being caught and imprisoned and things like that. Yeah, they used to catch them. Because the fry thieves would steal people's fries, yeah. Now, see, that's the other weird thing where I think... A lot of this advertising in the 70s and that takes that weird turn because you've appropriated the idea of story Mm -hmm. into your marketing such that your marketing stops being marketing, becomes a story. And then stories have conflict and that's where you get all of these weird, like all these food mascots are fighting to either steal food from 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 the kids or the kids are trying to steal food from the mm-hmm. mascot and that seems a little odd too yeah cuz that gets into like the general mill stuff the cereal ones and that always seemed to mm-hmm. be the story and it's weird to say story to the to the ads for that it was like you know the kids will never get my lucky charms there's yeah, lucky exactly. beat the yeah. shit out of him and take his food and you're like <laughs> Why? Why would you hoard that? Like you're supposed to be hawking this to the kid. Why are you hoarding it? Like, shouldn't you be out there? Or they would exalt the virtues. Like that was the uh, the Trix rabbit that would exalt the virtues of Trix or or the uh, the Coco Puffs psychotic bird there, and then mm. they would say, "And this is the best thing ever," and then not get to partake. And you're like, "What the hell?" And then when you see like that bird loses shit, you're like, "What are they putting in that?" Exactly. Is that supposed to make me want to eat that? Mm-hmm. Apparently and, it does. Yeah, and, it, and it's that weird turn that you get when you start moving into the realm of story with, with mm. your... Which is, That's which very is, true. Well, it is, and this is why I say this is one of the weird, typically North American parts about food in entertainment, is that it 
becomes the food part becomes less important than the entertainment part of the actual marketing so yeah well again we don't like to think about food itself food is just that stuff you put in your face mm -hmm. the, the there so the marketing is what it's all about it's all about the interesting characters that go along with it right well it's and, it's and the conflict <laughs> and the conflict well yeah we like to have that i well again conflict in, indicates value right ah good point yeah conflict means that they're care they care people want something and there are and they're fighting over something mm -hmm. so therefore that so that's why you know you chase luck he doesn't want to give up his lucky charms because they're so valuable right okay that's that why he's sense. not hawking them to the kids it's kind of a reverse psychology thing, right? I mean, the, right. apparently he thinks they're so worth protecting. Therefore, you know, therefore you, kids should all want to eat them. Mm -hmm. I have never tried Lucky Charms. I have no desire to actually eat any Lucky Charms in my life. If I don't eat Lucky Charms before I die, <laughs> that would be a good thing. Like even as a kid, you never ate them? Nope. Really? My parents didn't, didn't, my parents wouldn't buy any of the sugary cereals for me. They didn't buy any of that stuff. Oh man, child abuse. I know. I, I've never, I never got to try <laughs> Captain Crunch. I never got to try, uh, like, uh, what's it, Count Chocula or mm -hmm. Frankenberry. Never tried any of that stuff. I think oh, wow. maybe I tried a Frankenberry type cereal once when I was a kid. Like, it was over at someone's house. I think I tried it. Anyway, and uh, all that serious, that stuff, nope. Tricks, nope. Wow, I nope. mean, I, I had to make my own tricks by, I, we could, they would buy me like, uh, the regular, you know, corn puffs and I just had to put like chocolate milk powder in, mix it in with it to make my own tricks. Well, that's unhealthy enough. That's good. <laughs> so, well, yeah, that's true. So I had to make my own tricks cause I was a deprived child. No captain. Oh man. No captain crunch. Nope. So you Never didn't know what, it. you didn't know what it was like to spend the morning with the roof of your mouth bleeding. <laughs> uh, well, I mean. No, regular corn pops could do that to you if you eat <laughs> enough of them too. I, okay. I have, I've, had, I've had that experience. <laughs> At least you weren't missing out. <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah, I was. I was definitely damaged by you know children's cereal. That 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 still happened. <laughs> oh man. So yeah, the cereal ads got weird. The what got weirder? Mm -hmm. And there's an odd permutation that of this. If you remember in the 80s, like by like the mid to late 80s, mm -hmm. and th this is what struck me as weird, because we've talked before about the cycle of entertainment, that you bring something out for the kids, mm -hmm. the kids get older, you make your material a little older, eventually that audience loses interest, you have to go back and rope in the next generation of kids, so you kidify it up, blah, blah, blah. Right. Do you remember when they did that with McDonald's? No. Oh, there was a, there was a, it didn't last long. It was in like, um, yeah, it's got to be like the mid to late eighties mm -hmm. where they were trying to grown up the image of McDonald's. Right. And they did these weird ads. I think there's only a couple of them. It was Ronald McDonald at like a nightclub trying to pick up. Now that's not how they described it, but that's what it was. So you picture this sophisticated bar. Mm hmm. And it's this, like, sophisticated woman and Ronald McDonald, obviously on a date. <laughs> okay. I mean, I remember Mac Tonight, but I don't yeah. remember anything like that. Yeah, that was, it didn't last long, because, again, people were so, like, weirded out by it, because the idea of clowns having sex is just too disturbing for anybody to contemplate. That is so, when did this happen again? That would be, like, the, mid to late 80s. I remember the ads we were living on uh, Bayswater. Okay. So that would be around 84, 85. Mm-hmm. Well, we can, we'll, we'll have to link a couple because there, there, there's, there gotta be, a, there, there weren't very many. The, the outrage was astounding. Yeah, people were just really unhappy when they tried to adult up these characters. Yeah. And, and again, part of it was because McDonald's was trying to get an image as, you know, more of, of, of a, of a restaurant. I think because again, right. this is where you're seeing the decline in fast food. Because people, the 80s was, everybody were health nuts. Yeah. And then that fast food was a no-no. So they were trying, it was especially bad for kids. Because this is when you had a lot of the uh, concert parent groups worried about kid TV. Mm -hmm. So they were kind of trying to move that along. Yeah, I could see that. Well, they were they were playing with their image. Yeah, I could see Yeah. That. 
Because I, mean, I guess... they've done that different times over the years. Mac Tonight, which I referred to earlier, was almost an attempt at that as well. If you remember that yeah. from like the nineties. Yeah, and, and and it played upon the uh the old uh, Bobby Darren song Mac the Knife, which would appeal yep. to like the older people of the time and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, they also kind of did the th- same thing with uh, the McDLT ads. Yes, I remember those. Yeah, where you saw a bunch of people in sportswear dancing around. That was again, I think, aiming for like an older. older yeah, the group. whole keeps the hot side hot, keeps the cool side cool. Yeah, the McDLT thing. I love McDLTs. They were, those were actually really good burgers. <laughs> but but yeah, that was that was that was I think part of that 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 same scene. And then they just went a little too far with with. Uh, with the mascot. And then, it, like I say, it didn't last very long. Right, right. And I guess that's one of the dangers with mascots, right? Is that yeah. they are limited in what you can do with them. And especially if they do become a cultural fixture, they become very hard to change. Yeah, they, they become hard to change and they become necessary to change. Because I think the, the McDonald's mm. ones are the best example. Because they those characters kind of exist outside of marketing. Yeah. That's true. They're cultural icons. Yeah, and then that's why, like, you know, thinking of Ronald McDonald getting his wick wet is just like, d- no, don't. And for everybody, it was like, just no. Even though right. the, there was a lot of uh, impetus from the restaurants and possibly from, from the marketing itself. Because I know, um, shit, I think it was Japan mm-hmm. that they did, like, uh, they, they had an ad campaign around the same time or maybe a year or two later, like late 80s. Right. That was like hot chicks dressed up like Ronald McDonald. It's like, that's even worse. Just no. Well, there but, was the sexy Wendy one that happened just a few years ago. Yeah. Um, that's In fact, that's kind of sort of still going on because apparently like Wendy's, um, this just happened like a week or so ago. The Wendy's uh, Twitter campaign team whatever you could call them you know they're representing wendy online basically just tweeted out that any companies that want to be mocked please you know tweet tweet them and let them know so and they'll and they'll make fun of them Mm -hmm. because literally wendy's twitter feed has built itself up on being this like incredibly snarky character Okay. And so as an end result, people, you know, went crazy for for a while there, like drawing pictures of her. And then, of course, thanks. Rule 34, there were huge amounts of Wendy um, hentai material for a while there. Because, of course, if you've got a, you know, sexy Wendy, you know, character running around, someone's going to draw her naked. That's just a given. Mm-hmm. Um, mostly, mostly her and Ronald and her Burger King going at it. You know, that kind of stuff. Um, that became a really big meme for a little while there. Yeah, that's thanks. I needed more nightmare fuel. Okay, there we go. No, <laughs> she, well, you know she's kind of hot, so okay, it's it's understandable. Because because there's another hot and juicy. <laughs> oh, don't stop, stop! Because you you involved Ronald McDonald in this. <laughs> Clowns are wrong. <laughs> yeah, so, well, I mean, uh, no, actually, I don't think the that uh, Ronald McDonald is that bad. How about the Burger King? Yeah, that's and. See, there were those ads with Burger King for a little while there of him like on the on the bearskin couch in front of a fire. Do you remember those? Well, I remember they did ones like that back in the day, and then they they have because the Burger King is another one that went through a couple of permutations. I think many more than McDonald's, in fact. Much because the original Burger King, which came out um, in nineteen fifty five, wow, was he looked. He looked like a like an old timey like a nineteen thirties cartoon character. Really, I didn't. Okay, I've never seen that one. Yeah, that no. I'll link to re- that. Yeah, nobody remembers that. They also in the sixties they had um, they changed it up because they did uh they called him the Kurger Bing. All the references the... I found. Kurger Bing. Oh, okay, that's weird. And he looks like uh, it's it's a king guy, but he looks kind of like the old uh, uh I can't remember the company. There was an American company that in like the late fifties, early sixties did uh like a wonderful world of Oz cartoon. Okay. Where they were kind of geometric, super deformed characters. That's what he looked like, this version of the king. Okay. The one everybody thinks of came out in like seventy six. That was the the Marvelous Magical Burger King. The Marvelous Magical Burger King. Okay. And, and that's the guy with the beard and the tights and he's very Shakespearean looking. 
Oh, okay. I, yeah, I just found the uh, 1950s Burger King sitting on the burger and everything. You're right. He's a cartoon yeah. character. But he, yeah, he's like an old like 1930s cartoon character. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah, exactly. Okay, no, and... I know exactly. I, I, I found the material you're looking at. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll link to it in the show notes, folks, so you can see what we're talking about. Yeah, you're right. He's changed a lot over the years. Yeah, because in 76, when they did the, 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 the magical Burger King. Mm-hmm. You could tell they were kind of trying to ape the McDonald's thing. Right. And as I recall, they did do some ads. They they were trying to have the, the same thing. They were trying to create um, a setting and a story, but it never quite took off. Mm. And then they'd do, like, weird shit, which culminated back in, like, the 2000s with that giant-headed thing. Yes. That would just show up and was almost as terrifying as Crinkles the Clown. Well, yeah, apparently that was on purpose. They actually referred to him as the Creepy King. Mm, yeah, I don't, the, think they, I don't think they referred to him as that at first. I think that kind of got added by the audience later on. No, this was on purpose, actually. Really? Apparently there was an advertisement, if you look uh, on the Wikipedia page, in 2004 to 2011, a Miami-based advertisement firm, Christian Porter and Brogowski, took over advertising, and this was their idea. Okay, and part of the whole thing was they were trying to create a viral marketing thing. They wanted mm-hmm. people to share it because they wanted people to um, think that, like, look at this weird thing and share it and share it around. That was on purpose. Um, yeah, exactly. Due to sluggish sales and customer aversion, Burger King retired this version of the King in 2011 following a food centric marketing approach. Burger King CFO Josh. Kobza explained that the reason behind the removal of the creepy character was because he scared away women and children from the chain. <laughs> Although they brought him back fairly, they brought him back recently. Like there's ads now that have him. Sort of. There's another guy who looks like. Okay, yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah. He he still became a bit of a. Oh yeah, there we go. The character returned when Burger King paid one million to have him introduced in Floyd Merriweather Jr.'s Entourage. For his fight with Manny Panchao. <laughs> Panchao. Panchao? Sorry, I can't pronounce this properly. Anyway, sorry. Uh, um, the King then appeared in a Burger King commercial for the return of the forty nine McNuggets in June 2015. Yeah. He also appeared at the Belmont Stakes. They actually paid for him to stand behind at the Belmont Stakes. And uh, let's see. Yeah, in multiple times, actually. He's Oof. appeared as kind of this weird mascot. Oh, that's just so weird. Yeah, well, but that's been the thing. That that weird marketing synergy that, yeah, I think since McDonald's, a lot of fast food places have tried to do that same thing and make their own myth out. Because there's, there's um, shoot, like A&W even did that with the, the, the root bear. Mm-hmm. That was shit. That was 70, 74. It was? And okay. Can- in Canada, 76 in the U.S. And and there was a bunch, because, uh... The hell? What? I got something even weirder for you, okay? Oh, I'm here's, scared. Here's, here's your weird thing that I just came across this, okay? The Klingons are used to advertise the 2009 Star Trek film. The Advertising and Related Klingon Defense Academy website states they are an illegitimate offspring between the, Kling, the king and a Klingon woman. The Klingons are a trio of two males and one female that all feature the plastic face mask of the king with modified features of the later Klingons. Ninli head ridges and Fu Manchu mustaches <laughs> on the males and the king's crown on all three. Uh-huh. I don't remember that, but that sounds seriously disturbing. The fact that they thought through they were the illegitimate offspring is just like, <laughs> the hell? How does this work? <laughs> I have a scared. <laughs> you should be. Wow. Okay. I mean, yeah, just <laughs> going through this list of where the, where the weird places this thing has popped up is just astounding. Mm-hmm. It's been video games. That's bizarre. Anyway, sorry. Um, I'm getting <laughs> I'm getting us off track here. But, but yeah, the Burger King is one of those characters that I've always found a little bit fascinating, just how odd he is. I didn't realize how many characters he had supporting him. The, like the magical, marvelous Burger King back in the seventies, apparently had characters like Sir Shake a Lot. Yeah, there was a, the there Burger was a Thing and the Duke of Doubt. Oh, I remember him and the robotic Wizard of Fries. I yeah. remember the Duke of Doubt. Yeah, 
Because that was, they were trying to do the McDonald's thing. Yeah, yeah. So they were a part of my childhood. At least some of those characters were. Mm Mm-hmm. Because that was the same thing looking at, like, the fast food restaurants. There was, uh, Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, uh, the brain not work. There was the big boy. Mm Mm-hmm. And that was. Right? That was another one that came, uh, I think came earlier than the rest of them. But I don't think they exactly like personified it until again the early sixties. Probably it's probably when they saw um, how well it was doing for other restaurants, they decided to run with it. That yeah, would be my guess. Yeah, because it was uh, well poop. It was the uh, early sixties, wasn't it? They started the uh, the comic book that you got at the store. Well, there it is. Fifty six was like the first one of the comic. So that's coming kind of right around 56 is a few years before uh, before McDonald's started doing it. Right. I'm wondering if that kind of inspired them to uh, to to do that, that whole thing. Except, yeah, as I recall, Big Boy kind of just existed nowadays. Right. He didn't ha- live in his own little weird... He had a talking dog, as I recall. Are you sure it was 56? Yeah, because they because I have a reference here for the uh, Adventures of Big Boy comic book mm-hmm. that they did, and there's a reference here that says Manfred Bernard commissioned Timely Comics to produce the book. In the first year, the Adventures of Big Boy was managed by Sol Brodowski, written by Stan Lee, and drawn by Bill Everett, uh, Brodsky, and Dan DiCarlo. Yeah, DiCarlo considered drawing in the second year and Lee writing the series through 1961. Uh, let me see here. If you look at Wikipedia, they have some of the covers. Right. They list number one as July 1956. Okay, 1956. Okay, yeah, yeah. sorry. I was, yeah, 61. Okay, yep, you're right. Okay, sorry, I got distracted there for a second. Yep, you're right. Because through 61 would make sense, yeah. Mm. Of course, that wouldn't, wait, that would mean that the comic that uh, Stan Lee was working on when he decided he was going to quit and didn't want to deal with any more of this crap or one of them <laughs> was the Arby's Big Boy comic. It, it's possible. And then those other guys are like the uh, some of the, the heavy hitters when Marvel started up. Yeah, there we go. Um, no, it wasn't because it was if I remember right, the, the book that got him to quit was his boss basically told him to rip off the Justice League. Yeah. And then, so he basically said, "Ah, oh, that's it. I don't want to deal with this crap anymore." And his wife said, "Well, you're going to rip them off. You might as well do it your way." And she's like, "He's like, okay." And that was the Fantastic Four. Yeah, but this this couldn't have helped. <laughs> this could no not have having helped. to work on things like the <laughs> Adventures of Big Boy. But remember, that fits in with the comics of that era. Yeah, a lot of the comics of that era were were just silly kids crap. I mean, thanks to the code and everything, right? Yeah, there was that. There was also again. Um... To kind of loop this back around, because we've been we've been saying that the the mascot, the the fast food places, mm-hmm. is specifically McDonald's perfecting the formula is kind of what took things where they went. Mm-hmm. When you get into like the fifties and that, there are a lot of other weird, weird food mascots for for non fast food foods. Well, I imagine when McDonald's seem to be having success with it. I imagine everybody and their brother and their sister's cousin's dog basically suddenly had a mascot, right? That's the way it works. Yeah, well, th- this would be before. Okay. That that when you talk like the comics, and a lot of them did use comic-based stuff. Like uh, I'm, for instance, thinking of Captain Tootsie. I'm assuming Tootsie Roll, right? Yep. And that started in 1943. It was C.C. Beck that drew those. Okay. The guy who created Captain Marvel. Created Captain Tootsie. Yeah, and and if you ever seen, he's he's kind of a big, generic, muscle-looking guy. Uh-huh. And this is like the 50s. The comics are, again, they're, they're kind of batshit crazy because the whole point is you got these four little kids that follow him around and nobody asks questions because it's the 50s. Right. And the idea is that Tootsie Rolls will give you, like, the energy you need for whatever. And when you read these comics, there's, like, one where... They're at like a, a circus and a tiger escape, so the kids eat their Tootsie Rolls and manage to wrangle the tiger and shit. And you're like, wow, what's in those? <laughs> kids, kids were just tougher back then, I guess. Right. But there was a bunch, um, uh, uh Petey Wheat. Mm-hmm. 
from 48s when it started is a uh if you ever read uh any of sean baby's comics that's one of his favorites okay no i've never read that but okay he was for for uh peter peter wheat bread and they did these little com there was an actual comic book of him back in like mm -hmm. the 50s and he's this tiny little little kid and he wears like a helmet that looks like kind of like a grain of wheat Mm -hmm. And he fucks shit up. Like his little adventures are like him, like stabbing monsters and stuff. And it's like he kicks all the ass, and he's a food mascot. <laughs> okay, so that's pretty weird. There's a bunch. I used to like a uh, Volto from Mars for grape nuts. Wow, that sounds vaguely familiar. He's kind of like a Buck Rogers looking dude. He's like a Martian. He eats grape nuts that gives him the ability to shoot lightning from his hands. Okay, nope, I don't remember that one. <laughs> no, you would. And this is all before, like, it's funny because when we were kids, they had to put, like, the don't try this at home disclaimers on. Right. And I'm wondering if it's because just a decade or three earlier, you had, like, kids, I'm going to eat a Tootsie Roll and wrestle a bear. And that's why they had to start doing this stuff. Because kids are dumb. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean... You know, that would be interesting to actually do some research on, like, to find out who was, well, here, what was the court case that ruined it for everyone? Like, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if, I, I, you know, my thinking was it was the famous Six Million Dollar Man one. Oh, okay. Where the kid jumped off the roof pretending to be the Six Million Dollar Man and broke both his legs and stuff. Mm -hmm. At least that's the version I remember. But maybe there's a Superman one that came happened earlier where a kid tried to pretend they were Superman and jumped out a window. Yeah. I'm betting there was because kids are dumb. I mean, <laughs> I'm, but I'm wondering what was the first one that put the fear of God into like the um, like into the legal community, shall we say, and therefore into the studios and everything. Like there must be some event that happened that made them suddenly go, okay, fine. We will put a warning that says this will not give you superpowers on this candy. Yeah, I'm wondering. That's a good question. Because I think it's probably earlier. Because I remember like the Superman, you know, putting on a, on a towel as a cape jumping off the roof meme was a thing when we were kids. Like that was yeah. one of the don't do that kind of things that they were already warning people about. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, who was the one who really spoiled all the fun? Like, who basically, like, in other countries, they don't do that shit. They don't need to. Well, that and they believe in uh, science and natural selection. So I think that helps, so, too. That's true. Well, yeah. So basically, the worst <laughs> that will happen is the president of the company will come out and apologize and say, well, you know, sorry this happened. But if your kid wasn't an idiot, <laughs> it wouldn't have been an issue if you'd raised yeah. your kid right. But whatever. Mm -hmm. um so yeah exactly natural selection there we go <laughs> but unfortunately in north america that's not how it works yeah not generally so that's why we have to have plastic <laughs> bags with do not put over your head written on them <laughs> well that's again though it's because like uh north america and specifically the states because canada has a couple things that prevent this is like big on suing people yep so that's why you see all the disclaimers it's it's not necessarily because they think you're going to be dumb enough to do this. It's because if you are dumb enough to do this, this kind of absolves them of any kind of like legal, uh, legal. Exactly. Well, here, but the thing is, the reason they have to put it is because they know some people are dumb enough to do it. <laughs> and they, they know some people are dumb enough to do it. And they know some other people are greedy enough to try to sue them for it. Yeah. Well, you didn't say that if, if I put this bag over my head, I would die. So therefore, it's a choking hazard. Therefore... You know, therefore, you're legally liable. Yeah. Like, you didn't say that if I jumped in front of that car, that I would die. So, therefore, you know, you're <laughs> legally liable, Ford. Mm -hmm. I'm sure somebody has tried suing for... What am I saying? I'm sure many people have tried <laughs> suing the, the automakers for unsafe cars because they're... Because their, like, kid got hit or something like that. Yeah. Oh, that explains why all those, like, trucks have the word Dodge on the front. It's advice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you're in fine form tonight, Don. Congratulations. <laughs> that's it. That's a legal disclaimer. <laughs> wow. There we go. Okay, so anything else we have to say about food as sorry, no, yeah, food by entertainment. So what the so 
mascots are are a thing. Okay, I think we've covered that so far, and there are many different versions of them. Is there anything else we have to say about this? Yeah, there's two examples of this that I think kind of kind of bear mentioning mm-hmm. because it shows that line how like like marketing makes that weird jump. Because if you remember in the eighties, mm-hmm. there was an ad campaign for Folgers Coffee, I believe it was, right, with a couple that people the 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 one sh- had just moved in and can I borrow a coffee and it was one of those will they won't they things. Oh, yeah, and it went on over a couple commercials, right, yeah. Yeah, and it was an ad. It was a fucking ad. But it became this, and people were actually invested in these two characters, which, as I recall, never even had names. They didn't need to. They're generic guy number one and generic girl number two. Yeah, but it was weird that this, like, ad for coffee became this kind of, like, running soap opera for a while. I think it was just because the actors or maybe the presentation was so personable and such that people just kind of, like, took an interest. I remember them. Yeah, and you're right, but to me, because I believe marketing is the root of all evil, it just Mm -hmm. seems strange that, yeah, like, an ad campaign for coffee became that engrossing to the uh, public in general. If you want to see something that's engrossing, go look up the Long Long Man ads from Japan. Have you seen those? No. Half of our audience are cringing right now, and the other half, (laughs) it's a, it's like that, except it's for a candy called, oh, what was it? It's, it's, it's for a candy in Japan, basically. They're these long, like, uh, gum sticks, basically. And it's about a woman who's obsessed with this guy who she keeps seeing eating these candies. And he keeps popping up all around her in her life. And so she's struggling between her affection for the for the long, long man and her boyfriend, who seems kind of dull. And, and the long, long <laughs> man is played by this popular, like, uh, very handsome Japanese actor. Mm-hmm. And so she's obsessed with – it's, it's a running gag on the fact that her boyfriend is basically the short man and he's disguised the long man. <laughs> okay. Wow. And it, it goes on for a while. If You can find a compilation of them online, and there's an actual story, and it actually has an ending, too. Oh, wow. It actually has a, it actually has a pretty funny ending, actually. Um, and so, an actual twist ending, too. I was impressed. But, but yeah, once, <laughs> you, once, you, once you hear the long, long man, um, there's a jingle kind of thing that goes with it. You will never forget it for the rest of your life. Plus, they're just really, really funny. Wow. Um, I show them to my classes as an example of like brilliant commercial advertising. and uh, But it's the same as the Folgers thing, except the Folgers one was by accident, I think, yeah. if I remember right. And then they just made more because people were so obsessed with these people, whereas other ones like the Long Long Man commercial is an extension of that. Right. Um, there's older ones that I've seen, like, for example, oh, there's the uh, Messin' with Sasquatch. Oh, yeah. Those are one of my <laughs> favorites. That's, that's one of my – where – you know, the, for the uh, beef jerky, Jack Link's beef jerky, where the guys keep finding Sasquatch out in the woods and people keep like trying to play tricks on him while eating beef jerky and such, or using beef jerky to lure him out. And yeah, those are pretty funny. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, there, there have been some good ad campaigns. I mean, ad campaigns as entertainment, actually, I think are a very good idea. They tend to generate more buzz. People like them more. I mean, I'm actually shocked that it doesn't happen more often, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Shocked remember, and possibly relieved. Well, maybe. Yeah, that's true. It's having too many of them on. But keep in mind that stories don't have to be long. Stories can be very short and still be engrossing or interesting. Mm-hmm. I mean, stories have only a few basic elements, as we've talked about in previous podcasts. And you can fit into a single sentence. So you can sure as hell fit it into a uh, commercial. In fact, most commercials do. Like, take a look at things like uh, Mr. Clean commercials, for example, or a lot of, like, uh, household commercials are usually about this household cleanser mascot coming in and like saving the average homemaker from their drudgery and from the having to work hard like oh their life sucks because they're working hard and ta-da Mr. Clean will come in and help you and you'll be done in a jiffy so you can now relax with coffee and friends instead right that's a story yeah if you but use it... Mr. Clean you know it solves your problem that's the moral of the story yeah, it still troubles me that one day I may be exposed to somebody who's, like, analyzing the deep story arc behind the uh, Kool-Aid Man from 1975 to 1984. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, 
Yes, well, I don't know if there was a story arc behind those things, but I'm sure <laughs> someone out there, if there was, has compiled them and done a whole YouTube video on them. Well, they, well, they, the, the, the ads, that was another one that they did a, a comic book series. Yes, there was a Kool-Aid Man comic book by Marvel, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I, it was just advertising. It wasn't meant to be a real superhero comic, though. No, but it was because he's he's fighting like the, these little energy guys called the Thirsties, I think. Right. Well, that that ex- that's who those guys are. Oh, they're always causing trouble. Thank you, Kool Aid Man. Hmm. Yeah, kind. And then they had like there was two the obligatory two kids, and they had yeah the adventures, and it's like wow, soon to be like a three picture like uh, trilogy. Well. Theaters. Marvel had its lean times, remember, and they'll take any money they could get. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, like, now, J.J. Abrams has signed on to do the Kool-Aid Man picture. Oh, you wait. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's... But that's... It's, it, it's scary. But that's where I say, that's why this whole idea of how it's it's marketing that makes that jump kind of scares me a little bit. Well, yeah, especially considering how they're desperate to bring back any name that people recognize from the past, and eventually they'll start dredging down into advertising icons Mm -hmm. i mean that's just a given that at some point we're going to see like more mcdonald land animated films from the producers of the lego movie or something no they already did remember the uh the geico cavemen had a tv series for like a 20 minutes i didn't notice that one actually you are a lucky man (laughs) okay i mean they tried it but i can see more of that happening yeah. Just because, again, they're desperate for anything that people will recognize and might actually pay attention to or somewhat care about. Yeah. Oof. It's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time. So you mentioned there was a second thing, I think, that was bothering you? Yeah, there's there's one of the... Uh, when you talk about your, your food-based mascots, there's kind of a myth about mm-hmm. the, the biggest one of all. Santa Claus. That's right, because he was basically... Not exactly created, but shaped by the Coca-Cola company. Well, and that's the 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 what goes around because back in the '30s, the uh, that image of Santa mm-hmm. had been around, but there's debate as to whether or not because Coke used that in their like freaky popular ads. Yes, that featuring Santa every year, and there's been a lot of debate over whether or not that solidified that image of Santa Claus. In, in North America and perhaps around the world or not. Right. Yeah, that's true. I've seen those ads. I mean, he does look different, but he's definitely that basic image of Santa that we recognize today. Yeah, which again, it existed before, but it, it, it also, it bumps into that idea that they, they've, they, they used the same artist or the same art style. I think they still use the same style when they when they do those Coke Santa ads. Right. And it's that I, even though the, the jolly fat guy in the red suit with the beard and that, that image had been around a long time before, it quickly became associated with Coca-Cola because of those ads to the point that nowadays there is some debate as to how much Coke is responsible for us thinking that that's Santa Claus. That's a very good question. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, if they did that, then, yeah, he's an accidental, I guess, mascot? Because most Mm -hmm. people don't associate him with Coca-Cola, I don't think. Not anymore. Not really. They they come up with the ads, but I mean, especially for the ads, for Coke, the last decade or so, it's been the polar bears. Yeah, exactly. They definitely shifted over. I mean, maybe because they couldn't really copyright the Santa ones. In theory, anyone could make use Santa to uh, sell their pop or whatever. And they do. True. Mm-hmm. So I think that might be it, where it was easier to create IP over the polar bears than it was to try to claim Santa, even if they did have a great influence on it. Yeah. Also, I think they ran to the problem that Santa was probably, even though their idea of Santa was somewhat distinctive, Santa was already... A character that existed in popular culture so it would be very difficult for them to truly trademark or copyright him and it might have been a huge pr bad move as well yeah that's true <laughs> trying to copyright santa claus not going to get you a lot of goodwill no 
Well, I mean, it, it will amongst like business types will find that a brilliant idea, but probably surprised Coke hasn't tried it. Maybe they did, and we just don't know <laughs> about it or forgot. True. You never oh. know about these things. Okay. <laughs> So I think um, we've covered food from many different angles. Mm -hmm. um, any final thoughts on the subject, Don? Before we wrap this on up, I don't know when you when you 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 look down the line. It's such a primordial thing, mm. and it's interesting that if you go by our three categories, mm -hmm. that using food in entertainment or food as entertainment for some reason in North America never took off. But that idea of, of building something around food-based propaganda really seems to have hit home for some reason. Well, again, North Americans are all about the profit. Yeah, it's true. I mean, really, if something doesn't have value, monetary value, it has no value to North American society. Yeah, that's true. And maybe part of the reason that food hasn't taken off then is because, remember, food is something you can't really copyright. Not exactly. I mean, you can oh, copyright okay. chocolate bars or things like that. But if you think about it, you're not allowed to copyright recipes. Huh, that's true. That's part of our legal system. So because of that, there's no profit in, in it for anyone to like go crazy about trying to um, promote a particular food. I mean, there's a few that like, like for example, KFC, where they're, they promote their like, 11 herbs and spices recipe and everything like that, or the Coca-Cola recipe, the secret of the caramel bar. There's a few mm. of them. But if you think about it, actually, no, it's just they keep it secret. It's not that it's not something anyone can copy. Right. If you could, fig if you could figure out their process, you can do it too. Legally, oh. there's nothing they can do to stop you. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, you can't, uh, profit directly from a recipe so there's no point in promoting it or putting that extra effort into it so they don't see any reason to do that i mean food's just something that's generic and in the background because whatever it doesn't matter right huh that's a thought i mean i'm probably taking a very uh harsh <laughs> view of north american culture i mean north americans do care about things besides money but let's just say that money is kind of sort of important right yeah, you might be onto something there. At least that's a thought anyway. Yeah. Um, my final thought on the subject is that I do think that food as entertainment and food in entertainment, going back, is going to continue as we get more and more exposed to the Asian way of things and Asian shows and such to be more of a part of our own culture. Like I can see as, you know, all these uh, streaming cable services are looking for content desperately and things like that. I can see more and more of them trying different kinds of shows that might include things that include more food in the entertainment. And maybe some of them will be a hit and suddenly it'll be everywhere. Mm. So I do think that we're getting a lot of influence from Asian shows and yeah, I mean, and then there's some things that combine it. Like there's what Shokugeki no Soma, which is an anime series about people having food duels. It's basically like Iron Chef, the animated series, is what it amounts to. Mm -hmm. At a, like this massive cooking school, because that's awesome. And that was, and is a super popular anime series as well. Wow. So, it, so which is food in and food um, as entertainment combined. And so that kind of thing will more and more come over here, and we will hopefully view, change some of our views of food, or we'll continue to evolve anyway. Hmm. That makes sense. Anyway, so that's my final thought on the subject. And um, maybe the audience has their own views. Please leave us uh, comments about your favorite recipes and your thoughts about food and popular culture. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, drop by ObeyTheDNA.com to see pictures of a half-naked Burger King and <laughs> other show notes. And keep watching for Jason Stratham as Crinkles the Clown. Uh Good night, folks. Bye. Thanks for listening to the show. If you'd like to hear more or join the conversation, come visit us at ObeyTheDNA.com. You can also find us on iTunes or whatever fine podcast site forgot to lock their back door. So until next time, remember that to master the nerdly arts takes time, practice, and enough Coca-Cola to drop a rhino. See ya.